this is Daniela Cambone. Welcome back to the Daniela Cambone Show, now on ITM Trading. Well, my guest today says expect the stock market to retreat, a recession to strike, and inflation to fall below 2%. Joining me today is Professor Steve Hankey. He's a professor of applied economics at Johns Hopkins University, and he's a former economic advisor to Ronald Reagan. Professor, always good to be with you. Welcome back. Great to be with you, Daniela. So let's see, uh, reading your recent remarks, you expect the stock market to retreat, a recession to strike, and inflation to drop below 2% by the end of the year. My opening question to you, Professor, is how will this all be possible? Well, if you look at the data coming in today, you, 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 know, you have to say, you know, what, what's this guy smoking, you know? The economy looks pretty good. The stock market is roaring away. And inflation, uh, although it continues to come down, contrary to the reports we, we were getting a couple of days ago, it actually fell from 3.4% year over year to 3.1%. And, and it will go down to 2% or below by the end of this year. So that, that's the inflation part of the thing. The, the stock market uh, is, is really difficult to predict, but it's usually related to recessions. And recessions and economic activity do play a role in the stock market because earnings and free cash flow are generated from economic activity. And we think a recession is baked in the cake. John Greenwood and I, who I work with on this, these kinds of things, think a recession is baked in the cake for later this year. Now, if that happens, the stock market will come down because free cash flows will come down, earnings will come down, and, and multiples, which are very high, will, will adjust and come down. Now, why do I say this is ba all baked in the cake? And I, I'm so certain about it. I'm certain about it because I, with Greenwood, are using the quantity theory of money. That is the theory behind what's determining the course of the economy. Nominal GDP, and remember, nominal GDP has two components, a price level and real rates of growth. So rates of growth in prices and rates of growth in inflation. If you add those two together, you get nominal GDP. And it's very accurate to use the quantity theory and predict what's going to happen with nominal GDP. So why is it, why is it difficult for people to get their head around this? It's difficult because there are big lags between changes in the money supply and changes in asset prices, changes in economic activity, and ultimately changes in inflation. So it's the lags that, that are the problem. And, and when I say baked in the cake, all, all of this is, was baked in the cake a year and a half or two years ago when the money supply started going south. And, and has been in negative territory. It's down about 4.5% since March of 2022. That's, that's, a, that's a, you know, a, a big slide. It's only Absolutely. happened... Absolutely. It, it, that, that kind of thing has only happened four times in American history. And the biggest one, of course, we had to get to the 4.5% level to get down that low in a contraction, you have to go back to 1929-1933. We had a big contraction then, and you know what happened. We had, a, we had a Great Depression. We had a much bigger contraction, by the way, than the current one. But, but in any case, all these four cases, when you go way back and look at the contractions that have occurred, we have always seen that they've been followed by a recession. And that's why I'm saying think the recession is baked in the cake because we've had this big contraction and contractions always lead to slowdowns and nominal GDP. Help me understand this, Professor. So two points, right? Baked in the cake, unless 
there were to be a reversal in the money su- supply? I mean, could not well, another but, but crisis hit and all of a sudden? That, okay, that's true. That's true. But th- remember, the, the big lags that occur, e- even, if there, even if the money supply was reversed today, it, it, it would take a, a year and a half or two years before that would show up in the economy. These things aren't like turning a switch on, and, and they're, the lags are long and variable, which makes it very difficult to pinpoint exactly when things are going to go south or when they're going to boom. For example, let me, let me give you an example. Greenwood and I originally, once we saw that the Fed had switched into reverse and started contracting the money supply, we right. thought that we would have a recession by the end of last year. That, that was our original prediction. It turned out to be wrong. We, 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 were, we were way ahead of things. And the reason for that is that there had been such a huge buildup in excess money created with the huge expansion in the money supply that that led to this big excess. And, and inflation, which we got the inflation part right, by the way. We said inflation would go up to 9%. It went up to 9.1%. So the inflation thing we got right. The recession thing we didn't, we didn't get right. And the reason was this big excess was draining off and, and coming back to a normal level at a much slower rate than was typical. So once Greenwood and I saw that, we changed our forecast. And, and instead of the end of 2023, the recession arriving, we, we re, did a reforecast for the end of 2024. And, and we did that because of looking at the data and the, and the data were changing. And, and to quote John Maynard Keynes, if the data change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Or I should say, madam. <laughs> okay. So help me make. Sorry, so, please. So, so the so the lags are tricky. That, that that's that's what's tricky about the thing. The second point I want to bring up. I want you to help me make sense of it for the folks at home, right? Because you mentioned the strong economy, and we see the headlines that were being told. The, the jobs numbers, consumer confidence, great. But on the flip side, we hear, you know, we're seeing all the layoff numbers, you know, Paramount, uh, Paramount just yesterday, 800 jobs, Cisco, Instacart, Wayfair. I mean, the list goes on here of job cuts, job cuts, job cuts. You know, you're, you're talking about a recession. So, and I would argue that most people, you know, whenever they hear, oh, it's a strong economy, you know, the first pushback I get is like, for whom? Not for the for the middle and, and, and low income class here. So help us make sense of the reality today of the economy. Because like I said, most people are saying they keep telling a strong economy, but they're not feeling it or seeing it. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a good point. Because if, if you kind of look at the headline numbers for the job market, for example, the un- unemployment rate, if that's all you were looking at, it's it's down pretty pretty low, but if you if you look under the hood at more detail of what's going on yeah. in the economy, it, the it, weakness is starting to show up. And in, 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 uh, uh, as you get out in the weeds and drill down and things, you you see that that headline number is 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 a little bit of a a, a mirage, if you will. It, it think, think, things are not are they're starting to turn south already so so i would argue that the labor market's probably weaker than the headline that's advertised and and the and remember you have a lot of political propaganda that comes out of washington dc the federal reserve the white house etc cetera, etc cetera. and and the, and the headline that they have and the message and narrative that they have is that everything look, looks great, and they point to things like the stock market. The stock market, you know, that's an objective number. The the stock market indices, that's for real. And and the unemployment rate, it, it it's a real number. But again, 
looking forward and looking under the hood, you find that things aren't really quite as rosy as a headline would let you make make you believe. That, that's that's basically my thinking. It, it, exactly. So things are not as good as they as they seem. And to your point on inflation, right? Because I'm sure you get the, you know the pushback. Well, we're not we're not seeing. We're, look, even the president talking shrinkflation during the sunk, Super Bowl, but they're not feeling prices coming down. No, they're not. They're not feeling prices coming down because not, number number one, they're still going up. <laughs> the The rate at which they're going up is slowing down. Or the rate that they were going up at the peak was okay. nine point one percent, but but now now we're talking about three point one percent. So. So the rate of increase is slow is slowing. It's not going up as fast as it was, but it is going up. Point number one, that's the rate of increase. The level of prices is another thing, and the level of prices a lot is a lot higher than it was in 2020 before all this started. And and that's that's what people realize. They they think they think in terms of well, what were, what did what were things costing? Two or three years ago, and they were costing a lot less than they're costing right now, because we've had this huge run-up in, in prices and the price in at the price index, including everything, all 300 plus items that are in the consumer price index. They they literally have, have all gone up in the last couple of years. On the topic of uh, the Fed. And political propaganda we're we're being uh, we're consuming. Uh, I'm sure you caught uh, Fed Chair Powell's discussion on, on 60 Minutes. I want to get your take on. Uh, I mean, he rarely gives interviews. You know, obviously felt the need to explain what's happening uh, with rates. So your 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 insights on what the Fed is doing right now. Professor. Okay. Well, the Fed. For for we we have to start. What what is the narrative that they put out? Let's let's just walk through this like a sure like a, a point by point, a kind of a lecture type thing. What is the narrative? The narrative that's being put out by the Fed and the White House on this inflation cycle that we've had and run up in prices is that these inflation bursts that we've seen have all been created by two things, either chain, problems that we've had in the supply chain or problems that we have had with commodity prices going up as a result of, usually they say the war in Ukraine. They, they put it on kind of the Ru Russian back. So, so that's, that's the narrative. And the narrative never includes changes in the money supply. That's, that's left out. Now, I, I have, by the way, uh, about two weeks ago, there was a big lead article signed by four journalists in the New York Times. Their, their top four reporters on finance and economics signed off on this article, and it gave the, the standard narratives. And, and that is, all this inflation talk is, is all about non-monetary things. They, they, they mentioned supply chain, commodity prices, all kinds of ad hoc things that, by the way, have nothing to do with the Fed or the White House. These are external shocks that came into the system and, and caused the inflation. Washington didn't cause the inflation. The Fed didn't cause inflation. And that's just nonsense. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. They never talk about changes in the money supply. So let's get to the money supply. What is the money supply? The money supply, broadly measured, M2, is made up of the following things. Currency makes up about 11% of it. About 76% mm -hmm. is made up of deposits at, at commercial banks. About 5% are small-time deposits at, at uh, commercial banks. And about 8% is made up of money market funds, retail money market funds. That is what the money supply is. Now, what happened to the money supply? After February of 2022, it shot up. And, and by February of 2023, it, it had gone up 
it was peaking at about 27% year over year, the rate of growth. Now, a rate that's consistent with hitting a Fed inflation target at 2% is about 6%. So you can see it, it was you know, almost four times higher than what I call Hankey's golden growth rate, 6% a rate grow, uh, for growth that would be consistent with hitting 2%. So what happened? As Greenwood and I predicted, inflation went up. We said it would go up as high as 9%. Well, it went up to 9.1%. Now, we, how, do, how, do we, how do we know this? We know this because money is the fuel for the economy. And the quantity theory of money is a theory you use to analyze what's going to happen with nominal GDP, the changes in prices plus changes in real GDP. And there's a proportionality between rates of change in the money supply and inflation. I, I, I did a study that was published in, the, in World Economics in September of last year. I looked at 139 countries between 1990 and 2021, and I looked simply at the rate of growth in the money supply and the rate of growth in prices in those 139 countries over that 1990 to 2021 period. And what did I find? I found hmm. something very close to proportionality. And that is, I didn't get a one-to-one -one relationship, but the correlation was 0 0.97, 0 0.97. It was, it was almost one-to-one. -one. You, you change the money supply by 1%, you, you get a 1% change in the price level. Or 10%, you get a 10% change. So money is the thing that's not in the narrative. If you read the newspapers and the financial press, you have to remember Hankey's 95% rule. 95% of what you read is either wrong or irrelevant. Now, why is it wrong and why is it so systematically wrong in this inflation cycle, because the press is bought into completely the narrative that's been handed to them by the Fed. Hmm. And there's a compliment. The European Central Bank and the Bank of England have exactly the same narrative. The other central banks around the world don't, but, but, but the other central banks around the world don't have the kind of inflation problems, the big ones anyway, that we've had. In other words, to, to make a long story short, the Fed lies. And why does the Fed lie? Because they don't want the noose around their neck for being the culprit that caused inflation. And, and, and they say it's all because of oil prices, commodity prices, supply chain problems, all, all these other things that have nothing to do with the Fed. And, and Professor, does it become amplified because it's an election year. I mean, do they not want to be blamed uh, for how the course or uh, well, the, the course they, that the yeah, election they, cycle will take? They, they, well, they, they never want to be blamed. Now, now, this is typical, by the way, of all central banks. So all, all central banks do this. When inflation comes out, they come up with some non-monetary reason for why the inflation occurred. Uh, you know, way wage price increases, oil price increases, supply chain problems, you name it. They'll have a million things and, and they'll never talk about changes in the money supply, which is something that's their responsibility is changes in the money supply and monetary policy. The election year does magnify that because, uh, you know, when people go to the polls and one of the big problems they have is inflation and they, they know very well, I, I mean, I, I can remember just earlier this week, I, I went to the grocery store to buy a box of cereal, and the thing was like $7. <laughs> I, th th this, was, this was Quaker Oats, and I, I was I <laughs> talking about sticker shock. So yes. that's, that's what's facing everybody all the time, uh, or, or buying new tires for their car, or, or getting getting a repair job or what clothes or what, whatever it is, they know they're paying a lot more than they were three years ago. That's, that's all it's registering. And they, and they don't register that, oh, things are getting better. 
we were at 9.1% inflation year over year, and now we're only at 3.1%. They, they don't think about that. No. All they know is what they pay when they go to the store. Exactly. Exactly. So, so, so this, um, is, this is a big problem for all the incumbent politicians, and it's, it's a big problem for the Fed, but the Fed's done a pretty good job, by the way, of changing this narrative and, and getting the news out uh, off their neck. Uh, another, you know, talking point of Powell's during the interview was about the banking crisis. So I want to get your thoughts. He said it's unlikely we will see another real estate-led banking crisis. And now Federal Reserve Vice Chair for Supervision Michael Barr just said this week that recent turmoil in the regional banking sector is not indicative of problems in the broader banking system. Professor, your thoughts on the health of the U.S. banking sector right now? Could we see another crisis? Well... Let me let me tell you why they're peddling the crisis story first. They 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 bar at the Fed wants to increase the regulations on banks, and he wants in particular to increase the capital asset ratios of banks. He wants them more capitalized. Now now what that what so so that's why they're peddling this crisis thing. Bankers are dangerous. Bankers are bad. We had this with, remember, when the great financial crisis in 2008 when Lehman went under and the subprime mortgage crisis. What did we have? We had a, a whole host of new bank regulations with Dodd-Frank to tighten the screws on banks. And what, what happened with banks? The, the loans of banks went down. The money supply started shrinking because the bank loans went down. So they're, what they're doing, they want to regulate banks more. They want the capital asset price ratios to go up at banks. And, and to do that, they have to have a narrative that justifies more regulation. And they have to tell us that banks are unsafe and, and they're, we're going to have a crisis if they don't regulate them more. That, that's what the whole thing is about. Now, from a monetary policy point of view, this is total stupidity because this will shrink the money supply even more because loans are actually flat now. Loan, loans have, have not been growing in the United States. And what does that mean? That means the contribution, the biggest contribution to the money supply are, is the credit created by commercial banks. Remember when I said the definition of M2, 76% of it were deposits of banks. Now, how, how do you get those deposits? Well, one big way you get them is when a bank makes a, a loan to Daniela, what she do? You, you increase your deposit at the bank, and that increases the money supply. So 76% of M2, the broadest measure of money in the United States, is made up of deposits of banks. And, and those are, are created by banks. Most people just don't get this, that who creates most of the money in the economy? Commercial banks do. Remember, 11%, only 11% is created by currency. That's the Fed. The Fed directly creates currency. Notes and coins are created by the Fed. That's 11%. The 76%, is largely created by commercial banks. It's created privately. So what's your, I mean, what's your take when, when, you know, some experts say, well, we still need some flushing out of, you know, at the regional bank level, there's way too many I, banks. I, I, I think this is a great exaggeration. I think a massive exaggeration. And, 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 and these regulations will make things worse, not better. The, the, the regulations might create a bank a, 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 cri a crisis or more problems in these mid-sized banks. And, and, and the, re the reason for that, by the way, is that if you increase the capital asset ratio of a bank, what, how, how does the bank ad adjust and meet those new requirements? It can issue new capital, but if they don't want to do that, because if they issue new capital, that dilutes the existing shareholders. So they're not inclined to do that. 
So they go to the denominator of the capital asset ratio and they try to shrink that. And, and that means to shrink loans, not, not to turn over loans, not to extend credit. Do you think the mindset should be like, well, look, if you have, you know, over two, you know, $220,000 in deposits in the bank that maybe you should just avoid regional banks. Like why take on that risk? Well, I mean, that is one way to avoid it. If, if you, if, if you don't want any risk in your deposits, you, you spread it around so they're all covered. I mean, de facto, they are, they are, as we find out in the last crisis, de facto, they are right. all, all covered, but de jure, they are not. So if, if you are concerned about the risk uh, uh, associated with your deposits because they're too large and some of them are uncovered, you know, you open another bank account and spread it around. Uh, Professor, I know you've been obviously uh, writing a lot about Argentina, uh, and I'd love for you to share some of your thoughts about what you think um, you know, your assessment, really, of, of, of Malay and, um, you know, his shock measures, as they call it, that he's doing to, to the economy there. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you caught his speech in front of the World Economic Forum uh, where he urged, you know, the Davos elite to reject socialism. Um, your thoughts on Malay and what he's doing for Argentina? Okay, so, first of all, Argentina is in a mess, and they've been in a mess for quite some time, and... I know a little bit about it because I was President Carlos Menem's advisor from 1989 to 1999. So my my take on the thing uh, is, as, is as follows. The inflation rate, which I measure every day in Argentina, is 199% per year. So if Malay doesn't get that down, he's basically toast. He, he has a lot of good ideas uh, about deregulating the economy, privatizing the economy, liberalizing the economy, getting rid of a lot of these really insane regulations that they have in Argentina. So all, all of that's fine. All of that's, all of that's great. He's, he's had a big pushback on his omnibus bill, which he had to a whole host of reforms that were contained in that bill. Basically, the Congress threw it out, threw it back in his lap. So, so why why doesn't he do what he should do as step one? And step one is to dollarize the economy, get rid of the central bank, something that I proposed originally in 1981, and also get rid of the peso, which I actually drafted a law for President Menem in 1999 to dollarize the economy and get rid of the peso. So, so that's what he should have done as step one, because that would have killed inflation, that would have given him credibility and, and, and political support, which would have allowed him to push through many of these needed reforms to liberalize the economy. Unfortunately, his Minister of Economy, uh, Louis Caputo, has, has not followed that course of action. He's got the sequence of things all wrong. He's basically following an IMF sequence. He's trying to balance the budget first and, and fix everything in the economy first, and then get around to dollarizing after everything is fixed. Well, if everything is fixed, why in the world do you have to dollarize in the first place? I mean, I, I've done two of these dollarizations myself, one in Montenegro in 1999 and the other in Ecuador in 2000, 2001. And, and, and there are no preconditions. You, you just do it. And that's what, that's what he should be doing. So, so my view is that he should be doing this and doing it now. Last week, Steve Forbes came out with a powerful interview on YouTube in which Forbes said exactly what I'm telling you, and, and Forbes has it exactly right. I think Malay has just missed the boat. He campaigned on dollarization, he, that he was going to get rid of the peso, he was going to get rid of inflation, he was going to use the U.S. dollar in Argentina, which, by the way, privately everybody does anyway, but he was going to do this officially. 
and he won the election because of that. And then all of a sudden, he takes the presidency, he appoints someone who's not a big fan of dollarization, Caputo, as his finance minister, and, and he's put dollarization on the shelf and isn't doing it. So I think he's made perhaps a fatal mistake in sequencing. Well, speaking of fatal mistakes, I want to ask you if this could be one. I want to bring it back to the United States, to the election. And yes, Ukraine uh, will be uh, top of mind when it comes to the election. Your thoughts on Speaker Mike Johnson floating, confiscating Russian assets to fund Ukraine war aid. He says it would be pure poetry, but insiders I've spoken to, professors say, this could potentially be catastrophic. Yeah, oh, what are your it, thoughts it, on where do you it, sit? It, it, all these aspects of weaponizing the financial system and the dollar system are bad news. I mean, basically, it's theft. So I, I, I don't think theft is a very good uh, uh, attribute. I, this is this is Washington BS, uh, and 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 the the dogs of war are out, and 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 they're financing this war. If they if we wanted the war to stop and stop killing people and destroying Ukraine, the U.S. should cut off the funding and not fund it. It's the same in the Middle East. If you want the war in, in Gaza to stop, the U.S. has to stop funding it. What, who, who's funding these things? And, and that's the tip of the iceberg, the funding, because they're sending weapons, they're sending involved in intelligence. The U.S. is, is being sucked into these things big time. And and this is this is a dangerous course to be on. It, it's it's a treadmill and, and it's not not a good one to be on. And a never a never ending war is is a bad thing. And we've been in a never ending war since nine eleven in the United States. So this this is a pro, this is a big this is a big problem and a, and a big potential risk. Risk risk to the to the dollar to to. World War Three risk to to what? All, all, all of the above. You you never know. I'm not predicting because Daniela, it, it's like it's like flipping a coin. The the coin is in the air, and I'm not in the business of telling you whether it's going to land heads or land tails. Well, once you're engaged in a never-ending war, it's the coin is up in the air, and 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 no no one, by the way, has a very good idea. Of, of how it's going to land. Well said, Professor. Just a final thought from you. You know, a big chunk of our audience obviously interested uh, in the gold market, uh, wondering, you know, is gold doing what it should be doing? Should it be higher? Your your assessment oh, I, I, of the gold I, market. My my own my own view is that it's going it's going higher. Based on based on everything happening, obviously. Well, they, the geopolitical tensions, yeah, they, or it, it, there, 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 there are many factors. The most blatant one is that c central banks are continuing to buy quite a bit of it. And and why and why are they buying it? Well, they're they're <laughs> right. buying it because of these risks and and this weaponizing of the U.S. financial system and the U.S. dollar. I mean, I think that I think the weaponization aspect is. That's obviously why why China is loading up and why Russia is loading up. It, it goes without saying. Professor, I, I thoroughly appreciate your time. I know you gave us lots of it today. I, I felt like I was, I was in one of your lectures today. I just love uh, learning from you. So I, I thank you. It's truly a gift. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. Have a have a great day. Thank you, Professor, and thank you all for watching. We'll have more. Great content coming your way, so be sure to stay tuned to the Daniela Camboni Show here on ITM Trading. Thanks for tuning in.